All right, today is September the 19th in 2023, and my guest is Bob Haywood. Bob is a fascinating person and one of the world's greatest experts on special economic zones or opportunity zones, as he calls them, having worked in setting them up in 174 countries. Bob, you just told me that there's even more interesting things to your background. <laughs> Welcome to the show, and what's your background? Sort of describe my life as dabbling with intensity. My undergraduate degree was actually in physics, and I worked high technology optics for a while, helping to design the manufacturing process for the Hubble telescope. Then I went and got a business degree because I thought I'd manage big physics projects, and um, then was on faculty at Harvard for three years, uh, studied Islamic banking in the Middle East. Then I got involved with working in, in, in free zones around the world, at the time called export processing zones. I also uh, ran a nonprofit fundraiser for a number of years, part-time, as well as being an official for Olympic World Cup freestyle skiing, um, written a book on maritime piracy, was the senior economic advisor to the British commander in Iraq. And in that case, it was beginning to focus on how to bring stability through zones into a war zone in Iraq. But I also ran a nonprofit that was focused on how to terminate war as a legitimate means of settling international disputes within a hundred years. A large number of things, but I also have worked in 174 countries on the issues of special economic zones, free zones. And how do you... I like to call them opportunity zones because I think that focuses um, more on the outcome for the people of each country. And I think focusing on the people of each country is very important. Great. So we're going to talk a lot about that. Before we do that, I'm curious, how do you plan to end wars in a in hundred years? Well, I noted that international relations now is a monoculture. There are only sovereign territorial states and any monoculture can only settle disputes through violence. And so therefore there's a need to enter different types of sovereign entities into international space. It can be partially commercial entities, civil society. I think a stable society needs to have three legs. One is a allocates resources through political power, business that allocates resources through the market system, and civil society, which allocates resources through morality. And that no society can be stable without all of those. And therefore, I think there needs to be an international space, an area for sovereign commercial entities and for sovereign civil society entities. That's why I got into piracy, because piracy, by definition, is a crime that's committed only on the high seas, which is outside of the sovereign territory of any country. And if you think about it, in the 1850s, piracy stopped being a war and started to be a crime. But the criminal courts were the colonial courts. And in the 1950s, we got rid of the colonial courts because we got rid of the colonies. And therefore, we suddenly, in the 80s, found that we had a crime without a jurisdiction. And it was therefore an area where it was potential to set up a organization that defined the world response to piracy that was neither a nation or a, a multilateral organization of countries, but rather a combination of commercial and civil society. And that's what we were, we attempted to do for a while. Sovereignty became a very interesting issue to me. And it's one of the reasons why I, I particularly like opportunity zones. Fantastic. I'm sure we could do an entire podcast episode about your work out or many more out, about your work outside of opportunity zones. But uh, for the purpose of this podcast, we want to talk more about that. We want to talk about your lessons learned working on opportunity zones of the last 40, 50 years and looking what are the practical steps, considerations, but also cautionary tales to develop new zones. So some listeners and some people I spoke to me before are right now working on new zones in some countries and they're doing it for the first time and they're very much looking forward to hear this interview. They've sent me some questions. Let's start with the most important question. What is Hong Kong like in the 1970s? Well, actually, I ran a trading company in Hong Kong 
starting in 1979. So I'm quite familiar with it. Uh, I'm asking because I'm kind of romanticizing the 70s through like the movie and the cinema that came out of it. So Hong Kong was, 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 was a lot of fun in the 70s. One of the things I joke about is that I spent less time with lawyers and accountants in Hong Kong in three years than I do in one month in the United States. I, if I recall correctly, I formed 60 corporations in four hours. Now, they were to take advantage of certain patent and trademark rules, but it was fascinating how easy it was to enter a new business. I think critical to it was the fact that Hong Kong legal system eventually appealed to the British Privy Council so that there was great confidence in the laws of Hong Kong as it related to business and commerce. Fantastic. So from Hong Kong, there was a development where China saw that as, can we do it here in the country? Can you describe that part of the history of special economic zones and how you were involved in that? Well, it, it, China announced their special economic zones in 1979, but they didn't follow it with legislation. But I put an investment in China in 1980. I looked at the Shenzhen zone and rejected it because it wasn't designed to be good for either the investor or actually for China. They were seen as laboratories by which China could study Western management practices. And I like to say that Fortune 500 leaders don't like to be seen as lab rats. Um, so I looked around China and found out two things. One was that China really wasn't very centralized, which surprised a lot of people. I noted that there were two telephones per thousand people. And I remember telling my engineer, if they can't communicate, they can't be centralized. And it turned out that the provinces controlled any economic activity that did not cross provincial boundaries. And that turned out to be nearly 90% of China's industry. So we looked and found a radio factory in then called Canton, but Bonju, that we partnered with. But there was no way to legally form a corporation. And so you had to have a private investment decree, which we had to negotiate. We largely allowed the Chinese to negotiate a lot of it because they understood the Chinese system better than we did. Uh, but eventually, I wrote a paper that said the zones weren't very good and foreign investment in the zones dried up by 1983 and the Chinese decided the zones weren't very good. And I got a call that said, everyone said that our opening up was good. It hasn't been. You said it was terrible. Can we talk? And after some discussions and things, it was determined that they would create a new series of zones but including the old zones, would start focusing on trying to create a world-class business environment. They created the power of the zones to enact their own legislation, which included legislation on the right to form a corporation. When I say there wasn't a corporation, you have to remember under communist doctrine, every economic entity is a department of government. So if the mayor decides that a police car and it's true in the United States, needs to be transferred from the Southern police station to the Northern police station, the Southern police station doesn't get compensation. Well, if the mayor decides that your production line is going to get transferred to a different organization, you would not, as a Chinese entity, get compensation for that. So why would a foreign investor put equipment into a production line, which he loses control of as soon as it crosses the border? The ability to form corporations was novel, but it was important. And the zones started to create a internationally acceptable legal environment for business, and they became spectacularly successful at one point, attracting over $60 billion of investment in one year. Yeah, and they've since Shenzhen has, is known in history as a major success. I think it's was a fishing village or like 30,000 people or something like that? Yeah, I was and there when it was a fishing village and watched sampans smuggling refrigerators across the river. 
Yeah, and now in this day and age is a modern metropolis, a mega city, a manufacturing hub. I think it's several thousand X the GDP of its population. And it was by virtue of through being a special economic zone and the ability to form corporations and attract for investment, right? But only after 84. Before that, you could put an investment there, but the Chinese military largely controlled who your workers were. And they paid the workers as a private in the military, and you paid them at, I think it was 60% of the Hong Kong prevailing wage. And the military kept the difference. But you really didn't have control of your workforce. The other, another tremendously successful, of course, zone was after the original zones, they formed the technological and economic development areas like Teta up in Tianjin. And they're now cities, Tianjin, Tianjin, Pudong, are cities of millions of people. And part of what we realized in 84 is that China needed to build a city the size of Beijing every year to absorb the rural to urban migration. And you can't do that. But it might be possible to, in 20 years, build 20 cities the size of Beijing. And that's why there was the announcement of the technical and economic development areas. And I believe it was 17 additional cities to the original four special economic zones. Is it fair to say that special economic zones were the were necessary for China's massive economic growth? Yes, they were not the only thing that was necessary. Freeing up some of the uh, collective agriculture was also necessary. I believe that if you look at the poorest countries of the world, they have 80% of their population in agriculture. That's the reason they're poor. If you want to have a middle or upper income country, you have to move 80% of the farmers off their dependency of the, on the land for income. There's only so much income that you can get from an acre or a hectare of land. And in the 54 poorest countries of the world, there's only something like two hectares farm worker. That limits his income to about $6 a year. You can't do it any other way. Agriculture is not a solution to poverty. And that's one of the reasons I object to a lot of the aid agencies putting an enormous amount of their budget into, quote, rural development, meaning trying to make farmers more efficient. There's actually enough food to feed the world. It's poorly distributed, so we do have some famines, but usually famines are a result of conflict, bad government, and not a lack of food in the world. Plenty of food rots unused in the wrong areas. And so the other attitude that everybody has to develop at the same pace also delays development. If, I, if, if the World Bank, for example, had a choice between everybody getting one more year of education or a quarter, quarter of the population getting four more years of education, they would choose everybody getting one more year. I would choose a quarter of the population getting four more years because that will make a difference in having supervisors and managers in an industrial setting. Equity in terms of everybody getting the same thing is hi highly overrated in terms of benefits to mankind. Great. So can you also talk about the case of Dubai and what we learned from that as what makes a successful special economic zone? Well, Dubai started from a mistake, the special economic zone. When the United Arab Emirates was formed, nobody wanted the capital to be in Abu Dhabi, which is at the extreme end of the country. And Abu Dhabi agreed that they would build a new city on the border between Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Dubai, being a commercial hub but not having a lot of oil, decided they would maintain their status as a commercial hub by building a port on the border with Abu Dhabi. And that became Jebel Ali. And after they put $4 billion of borrowed Kuwaiti funds into digging a hole in the desert, there was no natural reason for there to be a port at Jebel Ali. And letting that hole fill with water, Abu Dhabi decided not to build the city. And the dirt roads, it took a long time to drive from downtown Dubai to Jebel Ali. 
I remember being in Dubai in 1977, and the World Trade Center was just being built and was the first, first high rise in the city along what became Sheikh Rashid Road that is now swamping the World Trade Center. It's hard to see it among all the skyscrapers. But that was a dirt two-lane road that you needed a four-wheel drive to get out to Jebel Ali. And Sheikh Mohammed told Sultan Ben Sulyan that he thought there ought to be a free zone there. And Sheikh Sultan said, why a free zone? We already have no taxes and we have no duties. And I've read free zones and there aren't about taxes and duties. And I always ask when someone talks about a free zone is, are you getting the types of investments that you want? Usually if the answer is no, why not? Well, his answer was because the United Arab Emirates required a hundred percent Saudi, uh, required 50% local ownership. And therefore, a foreign company could not come in with a 100% subsidiary. It had to be controlled by a citizen. And I said, well, could the free zone have a 100% owned foreign subsidiary? And the two talked and decided it might be possible. And that was the start of the free zone corporation. And you'll notice a lot of companies in the United Arab Emirates follow their name by FCZ, free zone corporate, FCC, free zone corporation. That allowed big companies like Caterpillar to have a warehouse there. And then, yes, if they sold the product to Saudi Arabia, their 50% subsidiary was involved in the sale. But they weren't down to a quarter of a percent on all the sales in the Middle East. And so you could just have warehouses, you could have training centers, you could have lots of things. And Jalal Ali became a, a, a functioning and valuable port for a lot of reasons. One of them was efficiency. But the United Arab Emirates learned that they exercised, and this is where the issues of sovereignty become important to me, they could exercise their sovereignty by, for example, creating a custom service and even an immigration service in the free zone that was independent of the immigration custom services for the rest of the country. And therefore, later they were able to create specialized free zones for charitable organizations there they could store relief supplies, the Red Cross, et cetera, in a, a special city designed for nonprofits. They could create the Dubai Financial Center, which imported English common law, which was important to Hong Kong and Singapore. Oddly, you don't even need England's permission to do it. And that created a, as Sheikh Mohammed noted, the one thing the Middle East has is money, and the one thing they didn't have was a good money center. And the reason was major insurance companies and banks were not comfortable with Islamic banking laws. And so they could create a portion of their country that had a different law as a way to exercise their sovereignty. Too many countries see that something like bringing in English law or American law or some other country's law as a dim diminution of their sovereignty. But in fact, it's, it's the full exercise. They have the right to do that. And if they don't do it, they're limiting their sovereignty. If that's a reason why a country isn't developing. And so Dubai found that creating special areas for special purposes through the creation of zones and amending local laws in a variety of areas to make those projects work was essential to their development. Um, Dubai is a very harsh climate to live in and would not naturally be an economic hub. I'm curious, what's your answer on why British common law is so important to these zones? And we had Tom W. Bell on, on the podcast before. So it seems to me it's about it limits the political interference of governments versus law being created by judges. Is that right? Can you talk a bit more about that? Well, it's important for several reasons. One of the reasons is that it's understood and, 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 can, and predictable. And that's terribly important. Now, why is it understood and predictable? 
is a bigger question. And it's, it, it's, it's kind of interesting to me, and it also gets into my interest in piracy. Up until about the 1300s, I think it was King Edward, basically what existed were laws in equity. People were required to compensate victims for their crimes. But you suddenly started to get crimes against the king, like disturbance of the peace. That was a disturbance of the king's house under common law. All of the country was the king's house. And if you disturbed the king's the, the peace in the king's house, then you were brought before a government court. And the government got restitution for a crime perhaps against somebody else, which actually was seen as somewhat unfair. Interestingly, that goes back to tribal law. And as an example, I remember having a assistant attorney general tell me that there were no laws in Somalia because they didn't have jails. But that's because a person who committed a crime paid a price, or the family of that person paid the price. There was collective guilt of the clan or family of, of, of the perpetrator. And it was not the tradition to, the, if the family wanted to punish the perpetrator, they could, but it was not the other person or the, the other clan or the government that would punish a perpetrator. Now, the biggest punishment would be ostracism because then you had no clan to protect you. And that's where you got, interestingly, people like outlaws, which were literally outside the law. And they developed actually their own form of governance, and they were almost like a free zone, that it had to be very much governance in equity because anyone could turn you in to the law, and that would be, have fatal consequences. And so there was a man named Lessing who wrote a book about the law of pirates, where the captain was elected by the crew and could be turned out by the crew and saw it as an exercise of democracy. It was, but it was because there was not a, they did not have an external legal system that they could deal with. And they became somewhat like a pirate ship was almost like a, a free floating free zone with their own governance because there was no outside governance that applied because the outside governance was death to pirates. But as we moved from the King Edward's time, more and more of the Western legal system became sort of a system of retribution in criminal courts. Civil courts stayed in equity. And it is what modern companies need is they don't need a competitor who is violating their rights to be jailed. And how do you, how do you jail a corporation? What they need is compensation for damages. And that's the basis of the British and common law criminal codes coming out actually of the traditional tri tribal rights. Interestingly, in Iraq, one of the things we looked at was moving the tribal rights into a corporate setting because commercial law protected many of the tribal rights of the leaders if the leader held a holding company of the property of the tribe. It was a very good mapping of tribal rights into modern legal code. And that's why I think that the English system or the common law system works, whereas the, if you want, the French system or the statutory law states can become very arbitrary and inconsistent. Part of the strength of the common law is its consistency across wide areas. It's fascinating that common law is so well attuned to corporates, right? So and to creating a business friendly environment. Well, it's also, it also works that individual courts of equity seem by users to be more fair than the criminal courts. I mean, why it, it's fascinating to me that in criminal courts, the punishment is often many, many times more expensive than the crime. It used to be perhaps that for auto theft, you might get five years. Well, an auto's worth $50,000, but it costs fifty dollars to $80,000 a year to incarcerate somebody. So the, the criminal system is based on a retribution and deterrence, but, but not on equity. The person who had his car stolen and wrecked 
doesn't get a car back from the criminal. And that was what shifted in the 1300s to where you got government courts. And for that reason, a lot of the crimes, criminal courts are seen as, as unfair. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, enough to talk about how to set up new special economic zones. And again, for there are some listeners to whom that is practically relevant right now. You said in an interview with our friend Max Borders that there's no one blueprint, but there are the three Ps. What are the three Ps? Yeah, the, the three Ps are predictability, which is one of the things I mentioned about common law, productivity, and then profitability. Most of the discussion in popular press is about the profitability, where they talk about no taxes or low lab labor costs. But if low labor costs were the defining characteristic, Haiti would be flooded with investment. It isn't. And that's because the first thing a company needs is predictability. They need to know the environment's stable. If the environment is stable, it doesn't matter what the labor cost is. It doesn't matter how well you design your factory. You're not going to get the product you need. And the product is why you're in business. So governments that, that arbitrarily change the rules or inconsistently enforce the rules are not prime areas people want to invest. One of the reasons that zones have been successful around the world is generally they have created a more predictable environment. Then comes productivity, which has to do somewhat with the skills of the workforce and some of the infrastructure, although some of the infrastructure can be brought into the zone environment, such as electricity or telecommunications. But if workers need to show up at work, you can't have political unions calling general strikes and then throwing bombs for anyone trying to get to work because then the company can't be productive. You can't have customs that sometimes clears a, a shipment of raw materials in one day and sometimes clears it in six months. You've got to have a predictability in custom. It doesn't matter that much whether it's three days or two weeks, but it's always two weeks or it's always three days. It allows you to have a productive environment. You have to have labor laws that allow you to be productive. And then finally, you get to the profitability. I actually think that in many cases, the reason why tax incentives have been important is that the tax systems are one of the areas where there's a lot of corruption in developing countries. And that you actually improve the predictability of the environment when you excuse the company from taxes. And so, and the, the tariffs... Yeah, if you're going to be crossing borders, you can't have a tariff charged on, on, on every border crossing. It used to be that the philosophy was to protect local industry, and therefore they had high tariffs, which made for expensive local products. It's unfortunate because that tended to mean that the poorest people paid the most for, the, for, the, for, for their products, so that low tariffs would actually be beneficial to the poor. The profitability, if you have a predicted, predictable and productive environment, you will have profitability. The, the first two are the, what the government has to aim to create for a business environment. Great. You also said something interesting in the interview around creating new zones. And you said there is no like one size fits all zone. You have to see kind of what's already there and what's the goal right? Sort of what's the existing legal system. Can you talk a bit more about that and how you arrived at that insight? Yeah, it's the first question is, I always ask is, why are you not getting the types of investments or the levels of investments you want? And that's usually unique to each country. And those are the issues that need to be addressed. I used to use the World Bank doing business report to see where some of the problems were. But they're not doing that anymore because there was some political corruption with the collection of the data. But the Heritage Institute provides a broader way of doing it, Wall Street Journal report on economic freedom. And the countries that are known as sort of the dragons of Southeast Asia that developed early, 
had fairly simple reasons why they weren't attracting investment. Usually they were high taxes, high tariffs, and limited access to foreign exchange. So the free zone could be set up without having much of an impact on the rest of the population. In the countries that are still underdeveloped, usually the issues are far broader. We've mentioned the United Arab Emirates, the, ability, the inability to form a corporation. That was an important incentive to put into the zone. In some countries, that's not a problem. In other countries, it's an enormous problem. The use of Islamic banking laws was a problem for having a money center. So they imported the, the English laws. In a lot of countries, issues dealing with corrupt legal systems, corrupt police forces, corrupt immigration or customs have to be dealt with. And therefore, it's seen that the modern zones are more intrusive. But the reasons why countries aren't developed are much more pervasive. And therefore, you, you have to get into some of the issues like the legal system, labor regulations. I argue, for example, in a lot of the Central American countries, they have some pretty good laws about companies needing to pay a one month of wages for each year of employment as a retirement bonus. But those are unfunded. And so when the company goes bankrupt, the worker doesn't get the retirement bonus. I would argue that in a free zone, you could set up a system where a half month, perhaps, of wage was paid for each year, but it was funded, would be actually preferred by the workers. And there are systems, and a half month is probably quite sufficient for creating a retirement fund. If someone works there for uh, a number of years, they, they, they would get a sufficient retirement pool as it accumulated. In Singapore, one of the ways they developed was there was a mandatory security payment to the state that was funded, but those funds were loanable to the worker to buy his house as a mortgage payment. And then as he paid his mortgage, he paid himself back his retirement funds. And that created the capital to build up private housing. There are creative ways of doing things that are not incorporated in a current country's laws and would be difficult to create for the entire country. I mean, I could see in a country like Honduras creating a, if you want, a social security payment to the government of, 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 the, of the zone that was a loanable pool of funds to the workers for their housing. But the workers would find that far more attractive than the domestic economy. And it would not be unfair and unreasonable. And so you have to look at what the specific situations are. In Honduras's case, for example, I found out in the municipal law, every municipality had the right to create its own police force. But no municipality had the right to collect taxes. So therefore, they had no way to fund a police force. And therefore, when we created the Zetas, we created a right to tax in the Zeta. We didn't need to create a right to create a police force. All we did was make them a municipality. And that way, the Zeta was able to create its, its own independent police network. If you have rules like that, that you can use, then it becomes a much more acceptable law. Part of the problem with Paul Romer's rules was he started as though Honduras had no legislation and therefore tried to create all these rights for the zone. And that was seen as too intrusive. When you decide the zone is a municipality and give it the rights of a municipality, no one's going to question that. And that's, that's why I say it's important to see what's there because you want to change as little as possible to get, as, to get the type of environment that can create a world-class business environment. And the goal of the zone should be to create a world-class business environment, but importantly, for the benefit of the country. I think one of the things that would be helpful in zones is to always include some of the country's own investors. They have an important understanding of the country. As I said, when we went into China, 
we let our Chinese partner do a lot of the negotiation because they understood the system better. I think that if you have a local part of the ownership and there are in every country, there are plenty of wealthy people and actually plenty of people who know how to build buildings. So you don't have to bring in foreign construction companies and everything foreign to the zone. Most of the Mexican zones were built by Mexicans. They had excellent engineers. It's, 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 it's important to recognize and respect the country you're in. Fantastic. Would you just describe sort of the problem solving, the finding something or understanding how the local laws work and then adapting it in an elegant way, like in Honduras, that requires an enormous degree of sophistication, I'd say. Right. So right now we're talking to some governments like in Montenegro, for example, and in Zanzibar, where that experience or that capacity is not yet in place. What would you say, would you say from a practical perspective, what do you need in terms of the team that's working on it? So say there is a government that's open to this. How would the team need to look like to get sort of a regime for special economic zones established? How many people, how much time would they need to do it? And what should, what are the main things they need to consider? Well, it's important that there be a lo local advocates for it and that you attempt to bring in local leaders who may be questioning or skeptical and listen to them. In Honduras, I know, I, I thought that Cardinal Rodriguez should have been brought into the discussions and all the advisors there said, oh, no, 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 no. But I actually met him on the plane flying out of Honduras. And I think he was very open to the idea if it was, if, if he understood what was, what was being done. And I think he's been somewhat critical of it. And I don't think that was necessary. So I, 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 I would always been glad to talk to the opponents to find out what their concerns are. Many of them are addressable. And as I have found out in Russia, a, a top Russian leader tell me they wouldn't support it, but they wouldn't oppose it. And that's a major step forward. And so the, The team that is trying to, from the outside, that is trying to bring in the sophistication to create the right regulations needs to be open to bringing in as broad a coalition of locals as they have access to. That includes people who are in government and people who are out of government. Sometimes the government doesn't, that, that's paying for it, doesn't like you to talk to the opposition, but you can help, help them to understand that it's important that if foreign investors are going to come in there, they would really like to know that if the opposition wins the next election, they're not going to be thrown out. I think that was one of the weaknesses in Honduras is that we had less access to the opposition and to the civil society than, than I would have liked. You need to find, usually it's a fairly young energetic lawyer who understands the local laws. When I was dealing with Iraq, what was fascinating is there were several things that struck me as problems that probably had a root in older Iraqi law. And it turned out that there was some of the property right were incorporated in the laws in the 1800s, which was why money wasn't being lent on property. But the modern bankers didn't understand why their banks didn't loan on property. They just didn't. And it took a little, little hind to say, okay, bank property is a good asset. There has to be a reason why it's not going. And you have, you have to dig down and find it. And we eventually found a young lawyer who looked back at an 1800s law, 1880s, I think it was. And it turned out that the government could take the land at the end of a crop season at one quarter of its market value because the value of the land was a function of the crop that grew on it. So once you had harvested that crop, the land was worth less as far as the, the, the law was concerned. Well, that doesn't make it good collateral. And so we, we worked to address that issue so that farmers could borrow money on their land to build irrigation. The alternative to it, which was being tried, 
was to establish a land bank, but technically a land bank under the Iraqi law would not, in effect, work. The reason why the Iraqi, the Iraqi bankers weren't stupid in not wanting on land, they just forgot why they were smart. And you have to get into the detail, and it takes a while. I, I think the job can be done in, in, in six months of intense work. Six months of intense work. Uh, to, to understand the legal, the legal environment and what needs to be done to create an effective business environment, discussing with businesses, political leaders, civil society leaders, labor leaders, and some direct investigation and research. Then you can start proposing what a, what a structure would look like. But you have, to get into, you have to get into the details. You can't just take a, oh, Tanzania has this law and it's working. Therefore, we in Kenya will have the same law because it won't work. It's, it's one of the reasons why actually zones have sometimes places gotten a bad reputation is because they tried to import a neighbor's law and didn't get the same results. And therefore, zones were a problem. If the zones don't match the environment, they're going to be a problem. Yeah, zones can not work out for a variety of reasons, one of which um, you, you said in another interview is commercial, right? So like any business, you can make mistakes, you have bad management or bad governance, and then political mistakes, right? So what can you say about sort of the zone having political risk attached to them? How can you avoid it or mitigate it, whether sort of the typical, typical pitfalls? Well, again... I try to avoid the political risk by including both the in-government powers and the opposition powers in, in the discussion of how you create a free zone. And quite frankly, there are some countries, what I say is, you can't give advice to somebody who won't listen. And there are plenty of countries that at this point, are, are, at, at any point, are not willing to listen. You're not going to form a, 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 an effective zone there. Generally, however, if they're talking about zones, at least a portion of the country is willing to listen. You have to make sure that it is a sufficient portion of the country and a sufficient group of both in power and temporarily out of power individuals, business leaders in particular, are willing to support it. I found generally that it's not the top oligarchs that are the supporters of it because they get such benefit from the current system. It's the smaller oligarchs that are at the lower end of the uh, elite that are the most interested in how they can become more efficient, more developed, more wealthy. In the Mexico's case, it was the elite on the northern border. It wasn't the elite in Mexico City that were most interested in creating the export manufacturing. And eventually the efficiencies that they develop, I, I believe, become so effective that getting a little bit of large volume is more profitable than getting a large bit of small volume, that they have actually become presidents of their countries. Bente Fox as a Coca-Cola executive becoming president of, of Mexico. I remember Hermano Blanco, who was the finance minister in Mexico, talked about Mexico had a protected environment, but the maquila industry on the northern border of Mexico was doubling in size and was unprotected. And the protected industry in and around Mexico City and uh, Monterey was shrinking. And he asked the question of, what do we mean by protection? Is the companies we're protecting are hurting. The companies we're not protecting are thriving. And that was the beginning of the discussions for the North American Free Trade Agreement, which, despite recent political criticism, was an enormously beneficial treaty to the United States and Mexico. And it created a Mexican economy that now is much more open. Without NAFTA and without the maquila industry, Mexican economy would still be mired in, in much more poverty than it is. The way you avoid the political concerns is by being inclusive in your development of the zone, is, is, is the best way to say it. I was asked recently to try to negotiate 
a border development agreement between China and Vietnam, because normally two neighboring countries are their largest trading partners. It made sense, except for the fact that Vietnam doesn't trust China and doesn't want China to be its largest trading partner. And so they don't want a border development agreement. They would rather have a free trade agreement with the United States or the European Union because they trust the trade relationships and the political relationships better. Surprisingly, between Vietnam and the United States, Vietnam trusts the United States far more than it trusts China. And we should be able to use U.S. diplomacy to help create viable zones, but generally we can't. The U.S. is not focused on creating opportunities for foreign investment for American companies. Yeah, you said that a broad coalition and inclusivity is helpful. Isn't there a trade-off when it comes to, so the more people you talk to, the more you might have a lowest common denominator? Right, so you can't make these zones like too ambitious or, or something like that. You have to know what you need and not go below it. Just because you talk to somebody doesn't necessarily mean that you accept all of their, their points. But you actually tend to have less opposition if they've been included in the discussion than if you've excluded them from the discussion. And so you will have an opportunity to explain perhaps why their objection isn't as valid as they think it is. A good example of that would be I, I strongly believe that a country has should exercise their sovereignty to the fullest extent possible. And a lot of the opposition sees it as a diminishment of their national sovereignty. Uh, but in fact, they're the ones who are in control of creating the environment, and they have the right to create different rules of governance within their territory. That's sovereignty. That's not a diminishing of sovereignty. And so you can at least get them to hear, if not accept, why something that you're doing is necessary, and it may reduce the vehemence of their opposition. Yeah. I'm especially interested in zones for the development of new technology. So I'm wondering what's the, what have you seen is the um, sort of the development of zones for traditional industries, right? So for things that are already known that are more like catch up growth, like manufacturing versus zones for the development of new technology, or like really innovative R and D kind of at the cutting edge. Or in other words, to ask the question, is the zone model applicable to new technology or is it more focused on traditional technology or business? Well, absolutely. It's suitable for new technology. The questions you would have to ask is, what are the needs of the new technology? Just like I ask, are you getting the types of investments you want? I'd ask, are you getting the types of technical development that you want? And if not, why not? And find out what those reasons are and create the zone rules that address those. They may not be the issues of taxes and tariffs. Typically, they wouldn't be. It might be a need for skills that don't exist in the area. Okay. Is there something in immigration law that's prohibiting those skills from arriving? You always have to address the question of meeting the needs of the technology you want. Interestingly, when I first got involved in this, zones were all about manufacturing. And I started to ask the question is, in a developed economy, 80% of the jobs are in the service industry. Why do you want to exclude four out of every five investor from your zones? And we started to get zones that would accept service industries. And suddenly we had bloom all of the back office operations in zones which had been excluded before because they weren't manufacturing. And now we're, you know, zones are not static. They're dynamic. And if you're after technology, then the question is, what rules do you create in the zone to bring technology? Is the need for venture capitalists? My personal feeling is that actually there's plenty of capital in the world for good investments. 
The problem is to prove it's a good investment. The world's not capital short. The, the world is idea short. And so, yes, you may have to have a different design that provides an incentive for worker training as opposed to, and, and maybe perhaps higher taxes, but, but, but an incentive for worker training. In one zone, we created an environment where there was actually a, a, a fairly high tax rate, well, not enormous, like 15%, but they were interested in employment and technology. And so a worker could deduct twice the wages of a newly hired worker for a year. So if they hired 300 more workers, they could deduct the salary as though they had hired 600 for the first year, and that reduced the amount they paid in taxes. That was a big incentive to grow that, that operation. We also said that they could deduct twice their research and development costs. And again, that would encourage them to do some of their research and development in that location and encourage them to improve the quality of, 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 of manufacturing or whatever processes they were involved in at that location. In Honduras, I was involved in helping to write their, I think it was 1987, law that privatized the free zones. It was considered, I believe, there to be the most successful economic development program they have ever had. The problem is that they sat on those laws and it was static for almost 40 years. And so they were still producing t-shirts, which is the bottom end of the garment industry. Now, even in the garment industry, you go from t-shirts through dress shirts, dress suits, to eventually you get to women's fitted suits at the top end of the uh, garment industry. And the garment industry needed to progress through that, but then they needed to move into electronics. It's essentially the progression that had, has to move, the length of the assembly line mattered so that you could do t-shirts with a very short assembly line. The reason that's important is if 20% of your workforce doesn't show up one day, you have enough skills that you can mix them together to still make assembly teams. When you have assembly lines of 20 or 30 people, it's a lot harder to, if 20% of your workforce doesn't show up, to have the fill-ins to keep a, a, a consistent production line. So as the industrial environment got better, you moved up. But then you moved into electronics, which got you into other things. Taiwan, on the other hand, kept progressing the laws. They moved the garment industries out of their free zones into the domestic territory created rules that allowed them to have their duty-free entry of textile materials or what they needed. And they brought in the electronics and then they brought in more advanced services. And now in some of the free zones, they have logistics centers that have billions of dollars in the construction of warehouses. They're fully automated. Instead of having somewhere on the order of ten to fifteen thousand dollars investment per worker, it's in the order of ten to fifteen million per worker, and the worker salaries because have, have 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 increased. Standard of living basically in a country is a function of productivity per work hour, and if you're going to be stuck stuck in the garment industry at the t-shirt level, or I know that they they do men's shirts there too in large volume, Van Hughes and et cetera, in Honduras you're going to be stuck at, at, at the low wage rates because there's only so much productivity you can get out of sewing two pieces of cloth together. That's why the Zeta became interesting is that was an attempt to modernize the zone laws that we created in the 80s so that they were 21st century laws, not 20th century laws. It's terribly important to understand that the zone that you create today is going to be, should be different in 10 years and perhaps should have very different incentives and it should be a dialogue with the government as to how you're going to improve it. Yeah, that's, and I'd love to tell you a bit my story or what I see in Honduras, right? Or what I'm doing here. And I would love to hear kind of your opinion or your feedback, right? Because, you know, I'm, I'm younger. I don't have the experience that you have in that. 
But what I saw is the unique opportunity to push development really of new technologies further, right? So in Prosper, we are already working on gene therapy, on very novel robotic construction technologies, drones, right? And there's potential also in like the crypto and financial industry. And it's a mix of local with some international talent, right? So the typical like Bay Area, Silicon Valley founder, plus local talent, Islanders and educated Hondurans from the mainland. It seems to me a good mix because, you know, they are very attracted for that innovation to come to their country. And it's an experiment, right? So we're seeing if it's going to work. I'm very excited about this because I see a lot of technology that's held back in Western countries, like in the United States, for example, biotechnologies under the FDA or like air mobility under the FAA and things like that. But the challenge with new technology in establishing zones is, and we'll see how it turns out here in Honduras. And I said that in Zanzibar, like everyone likes the idea of Silicon Valley or of innovation and they want that anywhere, right? But Jessica Livingston, the president of Y Combinator, the most successful startup accelerator in the world, has said people like the idea of innovation, the abstract, but when you show them something concrete, something that's new, they tend to reject it because they don't know it. And when they don't know it, they don't trust it, right? So if you want to have something like new technology, like Silicon Valley, you need to kind of defer judgment. You can't ask, what are you exactly doing? Because you won't like it. So you have to more establish a general rule that this is a sandbox where you can experiment with new things that you think are, are right. Yeah. And you have to be careful with it because there are reasons regulations exist. And one of them is for safety issues. In fact, there, that's an important one, which is why flying drones over New York City, you don't get the equivalent of the thalidomide in the drug industry, which I don't know whether you're old enough to recall was a Yeah, drug we talked that about given. that on the podcast, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's tough because... I remember the president of IBM one time told me that he had been involved in the development of the 360 computer, which was the big first all digital computer. And it was almost a, a disaster because the yield on the memory chips were so low and it turned out it was a water purity problem, but eventually it was fixed. But the president asked him to, before he was president, asked him to create a set of rules so that it would never happen again. And he did. And the first thing he did as president was get rid of those rules because it would also mean that the innovation would never happen again. And too often, government regulations are created for a specific instance like a thalidomide, which means that proper drugs will no longer be developed because the regulations have become too onerous. And you ought to be able to have an area where people volunteer perhaps for drug trials that they understand are risky, but their risk may be certain death in the near term or uncertain death in the long term. And they're willing to take that risk, but the governments won't allow them to do it. With drones, well, yeah, there may be some problems, but the likelihood actually of a drone hitting somebody is pretty low. There ought to be areas and perhaps a, a zone like Prospera now would be a good place to try it because the population density is low. You've got a lot of ocean that you can move the things over for long distances. Uh, perhaps it could be, be, be used to, to transfer things from the mainland to the, to, to, to the island without risk of, of people. You can, you, you can do it. Again, the, the question is, what's holding up the development and what can you do to create a world-class environment that would allow it. And that's true of technology. I happen to think a lot of the AI concern is what I would call neo-ludite. People wanted to destroy the steam engine because it was going to get rid of jobs. And there were people who stuck wrenches in, in machines to, to, to break them. But in fact, it created more jobs. There were people who thought computers were going to get rid of jobs. 
but in fact, they've created more jobs. I think artificial intelligence in the end is, is, is actually still a, a technology that is going to create more opportunity. Again, income in a, in a country is based on productivity per capita and the degree to which AI increases individuals' productivity is a way to increase individuals' income and prosperity. So while you may want to create some regulations that say AI can't be directly connected to nuclear weapons without intervention, you probably want to limit considerably the restrictions on AI. AI should perhaps not be used to directly administer its choice of drugs to patients, but it should probably be used to recommend drugs for patients, but be inhibited from doing the injection without human intervention. Yeah. The, the brilliant thing really is, I think, that specifically Prospera has created in the legal system is that it developed a legal system that evolves with the technology, right? So where you can switch the regulation from one technology or one business to the other, and then you have strong common law liabilities, right? If you didn't adopt into a regulation that was proper or insurers haven't agreed on, right? So it's kind of mandatory liability insurance that you have to adopt. Other, so otherwise, you know, to operate. But that not to talk too much about that. I just wanted to leave that there, that these zones really allow this tremendous legal innovation. And we have to see and prove that it works. But I think there's enormous potential really to create some of the most innovative industries in the world in, in some zones. Yeah, and law is, a very, is, is in many ways a very static, and particularly common law, is a very, very static, difficult to change thing. I, again, talked about piracy. Maritime law is particularly difficult to change. There are provisions of maritime law that go back to 800 BC, almost verbatim. And I, 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 I just have to throw it in as, 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 as I like it. Is ton is in, in maritime, when you say a ship is so many gross tons, it's a measure of volume, not weight. And it's because a ton, was spelled T-U-N, was a cask of wine um, that held a thousand liters of wine. And the the insurance industry created the term because essentially how many liters of wine you could carry determined the insurance risk. But try to get the maritime industry to change the designation of a vessel or the insurance industry to change how they specify a vessel is nigh impossible because you have to get every sovereign country to agree to the change. And it's almost impossible to do. And so the language and and rules of the maritime industries are particularly difficult to change. Now, what you're talking about is creating a, a free zone, which is particularly playing with the legal system and create, trying to create more flexibility in a legal system that has upside and downside. The upside is it may create an environment where innovation is, is encouraged. It may create an environment where innovation is devastated because the common liability is very severe. I happen to think that one of the reasons why we had banking crises in 2008 is that most of the investment banks up until around 2000 were partnerships with general liability of the partners, and they became corporations. And the partners no longer had personal liability for their actions. And therefore, they took irresponsible actions. In that case, the general liability that the common partnership provided would have provided a proper non-regulatory restraint on the bankers. So what you're experimenting with may be perfectly valid and very successful. But... That's why you have a limited area of experimentation, is it may not work. Exactly. But then if it doesn't work, then, you know, it's only on a small scale where it doesn't work. Well, um, and that was the intent in China when they started their, their special economic zones. They were located in areas that were not major population hubs or major economic areas. So Shenzhen was a fishing village. If it failed, it failed. It didn't, it didn't hurt 
the rest of China. They were intentionally isolated they, so the foreign influence wouldn't impact the Chinese population. In your case, Honduras is, has provided you an opportunity to experiment with, with laws. Yeah. It may, may, be, may be enormously successful. As they said, as I think what's fascinating is even in cryptocurrency, some of the U.S. laws somewhat protect the promoters of it from their personal liability. Now, they may try and put criminal liability on it, but that's somewhat different than putting a financial wreck your family type of liability that common law does. Yeah. Yeah, I often use the analogy to software, right? These special economic zones are kind of testing environments where you can sort of fork the code and rewrite it on a small scale in a testing environment without deploying it to in production or to sort of the large code base, right? So, and so I just think that's tremendously valuable. But to, to what else besides Honduras do you see right now as interesting zone developments to, that, you, that you're following or looking at? Well, very recently, I've been focusing more on creating domestic environments, not in the traditional zone sense, but how small communities can be stable and grow and retain their characteristics of place that made people want to live in small communities. Because I think a lot of the zone concepts that we talk about can be applied to small towns in the United States where they have the right to create ordinances and other things and to remove rules and regulations that are inhibiting their, their activity. But at the same time, want to protect, if they're a mountain town, their, the views of the mountains, access to recreation. And so I have been focused less on the international. However, that also is in the process of turning around. I've worked with a little bit with Albania, which has some major problems in terms of its economy. In Liberia, after the war, or after, after Ebola, their economy collapsed 60%. And I made the comment that what they needed was an economic defibrillator, but it hasn't been invented. And I think zones can be used as the equivalent of an economic defibrillator. I was working for a little while on, on, on trying to develop border agreements between countries that have traditionally not been on, had good relations. Timor-Leste and Indonesia, for example. And there are modest progress in those. They're not at the forefront of cryptocurrency and other things. They're in the really desperately poor, poor places. On the other, and, 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 and getting local authorities to recognize that they should play off their local strengths, eliminate their local weaknesses, but play off their local strengths. A good example was here in Colorado. In Southwest Colorado, they wanted to spend money to create a electric vehicle research station. Well, probably every county in the country want, would like to do that because it's, it's a buzzword. But they happen to be an area of the country where there's a, a lot of agriculture and a scarce water supply. They should create a research facility for the efficient use of water in agriculture. They're uniquely positioned to carry out the research, to benefit from the research, et cetera. I've been helping a couple of, a number, several places look at what their unique characteristics of place are and how that would interact with a more modern economy or with innovation. So, so maybe that is the answer to my next question, that you have to look at what are your local advantages. But I was wondering if there's sort of a general, some, an untapped opportunity, something that you haven't seen zones or countries doing with zones that you think could be a tremendous opportunity for them that you haven't seen realized yet. No, I think there are some things that could be done more effectively, which are natural resource zones or agricultural zones. There are people who have been trying those, but in general, they have not been the, the booming success that, that they, I think they could be. What are natural resource zones and why haven't they been a success yet? A natural resource zone 
would be a zone that focused on sustainable timber production, perhaps sustainable sustainable mining, which would involve the local communities as opposed to just the national governments creating these zones that provide revenue to the national government, but the indigenous tribes around the areas aren't aren't part of the decision-making process. I think there's a lot of zones, as I said, that could be more inclusive, that would be beneficial to both the zone and the rest of the community. I guess, I guess in a sense is, I think there's a better way to integrate some of these zones with the national economies and to help the national economies benefit from the strengths of the zone. Too often the zones are seen by the governments as an enclave and the local economies don't benefit. Now, I know in Mexico, there's always been a push to try and get more Mexican raw material used in their export industry, but there were structural reasons why that didn't take place. The transportation from the Mexican industrial centers to the border where the assembly work was taking place was poorer than the transportation networks from East Asia to the production areas in the North. That's hard to overcome. There are also attitude problems that, again, a lot of the Mexican companies wanted high revenue on low volume as opposed to small revenue on huge volume. And what world suppliers do is a relatively small amount of revenue on large volume. The Mexicans didn't see the, for a long time, for a generation, haven't seen the advantage of that. Now, that tends to be a generational shift. And one of the things that I think zones can help with is that generational shift. I think countries could do a better job of understanding the benefits of the zones in their country and bringing it into the rest of the economy, particularly as zone managers become more local. They can be attracted outside of the zone to run facilities that are national to the benefit of of the country. But there may need to be rules and regulations that are changed to allow that to happen. I don't think there's any particularly industry that I see now that is not being taken care of in zones. I've, I've been pleased by, by sometimes being surprised by suddenly seeing, seeing one in the future and say, oh, we could do that better with a zone. Again, I think zones are tremendously flexible as long as you ask the question is, what are your goals? Why are you not meeting them? What needs to change? And assume that you can change anything. And, and, and as long as your purpose is beneficial and not personal greed, it may be possible to create that. I think by and large, people are good. There are some bad people and you do have to prevent that. I think part of the problems with zone sometimes is, well, I like a lot of the ideas of libertarians. Sometimes they can go a little bit too far in terms of personal interest instead of global interest. I had an interesting time one time as I gave a talk to the Brain Trust of the Ayn Rand Institute in which I talked about charity and why charity fit into an Ayn Rand type of philosophy and where it should. The three pillars of society, the government, industry, and and, and, and charity as all being essential. And there may be more that can be done perhaps with nonprofits in as I say that it, it, with nonprofits in special economic zones, it is encouraging in the development of a place like Pasprer nonprofits to work with the, the locals on helping them to benefit from the advantages of the zone. Yeah. Uh, as a final question, you said that multilateral agencies often hurt the development of zones. Can you talk about that? Well, there was a U.S. regulation that said the USAID could not provide funding to any projects which would take a single American job. So they stopped funding free zones and economic zones entirely. That's what was absurd. The World Bank will tell you that a special economic zone is a second best 
solution because the best solution would be for the country as a whole to have a more open trading regime. But politically, the country as a whole can't have a more open trading regime because there's too many people who benefit from the restrictions. And so they periodically stop funding any sort of special economic zone development. And then they, they tend to pile onto each of their projects far too many objectives. For example, in, in, in Kenya, they created the Athi River Zone about 30 miles outside of Nairobi because they didn't want to increase urban congestion. Well, that meant that any investors had to bust workers from Nairobi to the zone, which increased costs and decreased production flexibility and, and, and started to create a squatter town, perhaps around the zone, because there were no municipal services being provided for people who wanted to live out there and not be commuted daily. Meanwhile, a private zone in Nairobi was full of investors and couldn't expand because of limited land. And it took years for Athi River to develop into a large zone and local towns to grow enough in population to provide a workforce. Therefore, the World Bank declared that, that the Athi River zone was unsuccessful and zones weren't successful. But they, they put, oh, it, 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 if it hires too many women, then it's not good because it's discriminatory. If it hires too many men, then it's not good because it doesn't give value to women. If it attracts a lot of workers, it contributes to urban congestion. If it doesn't attract workers, it fails. You need to be able to evaluate projects and say, this is designed to employ women. This is designed to employ men. This is designed to develop the rural community in non-agricultural activities, but it's not designed specifically to help women or help something else, help, help men or something like that. You can't put all your objectives on every project. You can put all your objectives on a portfolio of projects, but not on every project. And so the aid agencies tend to put too many objectives on every project. And they also are too driven by theory and not by practice. I've always liked the saying that what operations research, economists, et cetera, seek is the precise solution to the approximate problem. And what management needs is the approximate solution to the precise problem. And too often, they feel they're successful because they've matched their models, but the models don't match reality. That's why, that's why I tend to say that, 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 that I'm a practicing economist rather than an academic economist. Yeah, same, the, same theories with my are journey. mostly wrong. Yeah, yeah, same with my journey. I spent too much time in academia, theory, think tanks, and then I switched to becoming a practitioner. And I think that's very, way more delivering on the side of having an impact just by being precise. Well, I, um, I, I, I say that economics is a great field of study. But when you graduate, you have to forget half of what you learned. The problem is you don't know which half. So, that's great. And then it turns out the other half is actually turning really valuable for practical matters. But you have to just learn, okay, which ones are the correct ones to forget and which ones are the ones that end up being valuable. Well, there, there was an academic paper that was quoted to me quite often by finance ministers and others that basically said free zones don't help the domestic economy. But the assumption of the paper was that you had unlimited capital and full employment. Now, I don't know of any country that is seeking to develop free zones that has unlimited capital and full employment. It's not a developing country. If it has those attributes, it's a developed country. The, sec the second thing is, and, and it's a little bit goes back to what I said before, is you used to have the Washington consensus that in order to be, become a developed country, you needed a good education system, you needed good highways, you needed good infrastructure. Well, if you had all those, you'd be developed. That's not how you start. And again, if the international aid community could put a one-lane road over the whole country, 
or a superhighway from the main manufacturing center to the port, they'd build the one-way road off over the whole country. But that's not going to be as beneficial as if they built a superhighway. They wanted to locate special economic zones in the worst part of the country in order to encourage regional development. But the country wasn't attracting any investment anyway. It should be put in the best part of the country. It should offer the best the country can offer, not try to mitigate the worst the country can offer. And so that, that they're often in conflict with, with what makes practical sense. In any case. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm at the end of my questions. Is there anything that we haven't talked about, but you feel like we should talk about in this context? No, I don't think so. I'm sure in an hour or two, I'll have plenty of responses, yeah, but, but at the especially moment, I don't. I, especially when oh. I listen to it again, this was so insightful. We can and talk again. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> We will. I hope. I'd enjoy a visit down to Prospero sometime if you can figure out how to arrange one. Please, I'll send you an invite. I'm doing a couple of events in the coming months. So would be very honored to have you as a guest. All right. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on the show, Bob. You're welcome. I enjoyed it.